thanks for that. Have we got have we got the thing? Good. All right. Um, so I, there's a hundred people online. Woohoo! Uh, so I'm going to try and be. Uh, although this is, you know, a little bit Melbourne focused, I think um, for the person in South Australia, yes, we'd be very happy to do a telehealth appointment with you if you wanted to have a bit of a chat. And I've certainly got patients from Perth, Queensland, New South Wales, and uh, South Australia. Doesn't mean that all of your care needs to be with us because it's a long way to come and it's expensive and it's awful. Um, but we can certainly give advice. And one of the things that I would think about, you know, um, what Jamie and I are talking about is that. Um, there's a little bit of stuff where you could kind of design your own transition as well, because you can get the get the sort of um, the the, um, the basic principles, um, and we can certainly help you a little bit with that, even if you're not in our system. Because um, I've learnt a lot of things about transition since I started doing this. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I gave this talk to the to the doctors and researchers and everything yesterday, so I figure you guys can have the same talk. That means I don't have to write two, but um, tell me if there's anything that's completely irrelevant. Um, so you know, ten years ago, I probably had hardly any patients with NF. Um, we always had NF2 at Royal Melbourne, so um, because of because of a specific surgical bent on taking out acoustic neuromas. But apart from that, I probably had knew very little about NF. Um, but you know, I understand that it's a complex disease and and a vulnerable group of patients. And so you know, I was used to looking after patients with gliomas and various other brain tumours. So I do complex and vulnerable. Um, so that's. That was, I thought, good. And I, I really don't need to tell you, uh, any of you guys, about the disease, other than that it affects almost all body systems, but it's particularly, you know, affecting of the central nervous system. So that's where I live. So what are the challenges of adult neurofibromatosis care in Australia? Well, one of the biggest problems is a non-expert workforce. There's only a few of us who are really know anything about it um, a lot. Um, and yet, you know, you guys have to uh, find care um, from a GP who might have one patient with NF, um, or you go into the clinic and there's a registrar there who's like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, I've never seen that before, um, which is not particularly helpful. Um, lots of uh, lots of different um, situations that you would be used to where it was a, you know, a non-expert workforce. Even the anaesthetist who might do your anaesthetic for something minor and unrelated might go, oh, I don't know whether this is... I shouldn't know anything about this or not. Um, there's distance, of course, um, especially with small specialised centres. We're used to dealing with that in neurosurgery because, you know, there's there's no neurosurgery outside of Melbourne for any different sorts of central nervous system things, even your back surgery. So um, we're a bit used to dealing with that. And that, with that comes cost, the cost of travelling and the cost of um, appointments. There's not really good protocols for imaging or follow-up for for adults with NF. How often should you get a brain scan? How often should you get a spine scan? You know, what should we do? We need to follow that plexiform neurofibroma in your belly or not? Um, so there's not a good they're not a good protocols. Um, it, we don't have good engagement from primary care or GPs, and that's not because they're bad. It's just because they need to. They might have one patient with NF, and they've got one other patient with something else rare, and they've got one other patient with a brain tumour, maybe. But they've got, you know, 60 patients with migraines and 100 patients with a sore back. So, you know, how how are they going to possibly know about everything in a detailed way? Um, and for adults, there's a limited capacity for multidisciplinary care and for allied health. It's not like the children's hospital where they're tripping over allied health people, all desperate to help you. In the adult world, that is much less available, largely due to money, unless you would all like to pay 75 cents in the dollar in your tax um, so that we can employ some more allied health people. Unfortunately, that is the reality. Um, so what's healthcare like for adults with NF? And I'm pretty sure you guys all know about this. Sometimes it can be a little bit like wandering around in the wilderness looking for the promised land. Who's, who's going to look after me? What am I going to do? How do I find that appointment? Um, how do I find a person who even knows about this um, or who will engage with me? And, um, of course, none of us are perfect. I'm certainly not perfect at it either. I'm still sure that there's people who I'm looking after who still feel like they're wandering around in the wilderness. But... Um, at least we, we do try and understand. So 
Um, I got involved because of the transition where Gabby called me, and I'm never forgiving him because now I'm so busy with this, although I do enjoy it, but, you know, um, called me and said, oh, look, we don't really have anywhere to transition our kids to. Could you be involved with this? And I thought that sounds interesting. And he said, oh, that would only be seven or eight patients a year. And I thought, oh, well, that's tolerable. We could, we could deal with that. That's not a problem. Uh, and so it, you've, you've heard about our transition process where we sort of walk, well, before COVID, walked up the road. But I think the big thing that, that, that Jamie's really showed is the difference between the, the, the paediatric system and the adult system. We call the children's hospital the clown doctor hospital, um, you know, because like they've got so much stuff. You go in there and it says meerkats and, and lots of allied health people and nurses and the, the carpets are all clean and no one's run a bed into the wall and not fixed it. Um, and there's usually no one actually being jailed out the front of the hospital. Um, and then you come down to the Royal Melbourne. Of course, that's, that's the old picture of the Royal Melbourne, but still, the building was the 1940s. It has not been real built. Every so often it spits a brick out of the wall because it wasn't properly um, built so that it had the joints in it for heat and cold. So every so often it spits a brick out of the wall. To stop that, the government had three options. I can't remember what option one was. Option two was rebuild. Option three was in case the Royal Melbourne Hospital in chicken wire and they went for the chicken wire option. So if you go to the Royal Melbourne and you have a look and you see there's this sort of cyclone fencing on the, on the wall, it's because a brick may spit out and at least it'll be caught by the wire. So, you know, that's a big, it's a big transition. It's, I mean, it's not the same with all adult hospitals, but it's, it's a flavour of going from a very well-supported environment to an environment that's not nearly as um, able because of money and all sorts of other things, not nearly as able to be focusing on you the way that you can in the paediatric situation. Not great. Um, so, but we started this and then word got around. So there was, of course, the, the parents of children who had NF who transitioned to us who had not, not have been seen for a long time. Um, the, you know, CTF and other neurofibromatosis patient groups heard about Royal Melbourne starting a clinic. Um, we, somehow we got the re to be the referral centre on the health pathways thing. We, I don't know how that happened. We just suddenly appeared. Um, we found a lot of, say, my trainees who'd gone off to other, other hospitals who set, found a patient just sort of turning up every year to the, a general neurosurgery or neuro-oncology clinic who didn't really have anyone looking after them. They referred them to, to us, same with genetics clinics. And so then, um, you know, even despite COVID and everything else, we had this chaos of having 91 um, new referrals in, in two years, um, which was a lot of patients. Um, and so we went from thinking that we might have one half-day clinic every three months to a full-day clinic every three months and now really there's not a day when we don't have an NF patient in our weekly clinics morning or afternoon, um, which in one way, it's, it's fine, that's great, but it also means that the sort of the idea that we would have this little, little block of time where we'd have all of the specialists there that we might need to see can't really work because I can't have all of those specialists there every week, but we try and make it work. Um, so this is, I got this, you know, when I was starting to do this off the web as to what people recommend neurofibromatosis care looks like. And I'd be really interested to see if everyone thinks that they get this um, in their adult neurofibromatosis care. All follow-up visits should include elaborate history taking and physical exam. Who feels like they get uh, uh, elaborate history taking and elaborate physical exam at every, uh, every appointment they go to? No one. Yeah, I know. I, it's like, it's, it's just not possible. So we have to work out how we can still provide a good service without, um, you know, without, provide, without, uh, without making it take the, all the time that we have, but still doing a good job. Um, and, you know, there's all these protocols where we have to say, well, this person needs 
um, this and this other person, they don't have scoliosis, they have this other problem, so they need a different thing. And, and working out what each patient needs and trying to make that specific is really important. And for, say, an average patient here, we might go through a list and we'll say, well, they don't have an optic nerve glioma, so they just need to see the eye doctor once. But they do have, like, lots of cutaneous um, NFs, that, that some of which they want removed, so we need to get that sorted. You know, they might have a painful plexiform. They might have, um, you know, not be thinking about having babies, but later they are thinking about having babies. So everything changes for each patient, both for the patient themselves, but also over time. So it gets quite complicated. Who's ever felt that the person they're talking to in the clinic really doesn't understand the complexity of what is going on with them? Come on, be honest. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, okay, so what, what do we need in a clinic? We need all these people. Yeah. What do we have in our clinic? Uh, we've, we've got really good of those things because they were there before, because we set this up in our neuro-oncology clinic. Um, we've got pretty good telehealth, which is important. We, we've now got, pre and I'll talk about our checklists, and we've got good clinical trials access, but, uh, you know, plastic surgery, they'll come if we, we call them, but they're not there on the day. All of these other things are referral services, so you might have a million appointments, which is really annoying. Um, and you know, although we have a care coordinator, Marcia, she is completely overrun and overworked because she also looks after all the brain tumour patients. Um, so we really need some better um, of these things. And we don't even actually have enough space to run our clinic with all the people who are there. So sometimes if you come and see me, you'll have to run around the corner to the other side where we're using some extra rooms because we can't fit everyone. Anyway, so what do we do? What did we do? And this is something that I'm really talking about because I would like this to be available across Australia um, to anyone who had NF1 and eventually NF2 or schwannomatosis. So basically we thought this is out of control. So many patients, so complex. What do we do to make sure they get a good visit every time? Because I've got 10 registrars, three fellows, one me, and 91 patients in two years. So what do we do? So we, we got a, we, I thought, well, if we have a checklist, at least anyone, any one of my moderately smart doctors can go through the checklist and not miss something the first time they see an NF patient and ask the right questions. And so then I can swoop in and go, oh, OK, look at the checklist. All right, I don't need to ask about these things. And these other things are the things that are important for this patient. So at least they've had a really good history. So this is our little checklist. It's not very exciting, but blah, blah, blah. Um, but that meant that we could then really target to the patient what they needed. And a lot of patients have said to me, wow, it's actually a long time since anyone has been through all of those possible things and asked me about them. No, one, no one's asked me about my mental health or about whether I'm working um, or, you know, about what's going to happen when I want to have a baby or a whole bunch of other things. So people... Um, actually quite like that checklist. So then my office was starting to look like, you know, one of those ladies in the hoarder shows with the piles of paper for all of the checklists that were there. And so we thought a bit further about what we could do. And so this is what we've just, we've got a, just sort of got at prototype stage, but not any further. But this is my plan, because I think, you know, once we've raised the funds to build this, this is something that could really be used across the country and you could take this to any doctor who was looking after you. But basically a, a care plan portal that would be initially on a desktop and we would test it and run that, but could eventually be on your phone. And Two Balls is the company that I'm help, uh, working with to, um, to try and develop it. But the whole idea was basically that the checklist would be online, but would be really smart. So if you put optic nerve glioma, no, that would drop off your record and we would know that that didn't need to be looked at anymore. But if you put scoliosis, yes, then we, that would drop in as to what might need to be managed with that for the future. And it would also help with decision support. So if you were a certain age, um, you, it might come up that you get to this age, you need to start having mammograms, for instance. Stuff that might be forgotten um, if, you, if, if you were seeing a non-NF expert. 
And so what that would have, well, it'd have a whole bunch of information on it and the great, um, the great NF clinic in North Shore is putting together a whole bunch of NF information. So that could also be on our, our website and our app, um, but it would have a consultation roadmap for the doctors that would give you what you need to be looking at for the next time, because the next time you come after you've been through that checklist, it would say, oh, this person has problems with this, 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 and you need to ask this, 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 this. And it would also mean that you could have a, the patient could have a specific treatment plan that they take with them that says, you know, you need an appointment at this time. And just, um, Jamie was talking about appointments. Please tell us if you're not coming to your appointment because they're precious. Um, we understand you can't come, that's okay, but they're precious and it means that someone else doesn't get an appointment. Anyway, tell you um, you need an appointment at this time, you need to remember to have this scan, you need to do this, you need to do that, um, blah, 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 blah. And also for your GP, this is what's happening with the patient and this is what they need to do and what you need to do. Could you check their blood pressure, please, in six months, etc. cetera. Um, so that's what we hope to build. Um, and I think, um, you know, at, for us, the NF clinic is just so many opportunities and I'm sure people are speaking with res about research and that later, so I won't talk about that. Um, and I'm very happy to take some questions. And I'm not in a band. <laughs> no. Is there anybody in the room to start I, off with who has any questions? Otherwise we do have a few online. Nobody in the room? Uh, where do we start? Um, do you look for the gene for NF1 for IVF? What happens if you can't find it? Do you test again? What different tests are there? I'm not sure if you... Uh, I am not a geneticist, no. um, but if people are considering, um, considering pregnancy, then yes, we send them to the genetics clinic to test. Um, I've been in that situation where they haven't been able to find anything a bit, but I can't remember what they did. But I, um, yeah, th that's a genetics question. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Hello, Kate. I found out I had NF1 when my son was born. Very big shock. I have a referral to see you. How long is the wait time at the moment? <laughs> uh, so the wait time can be up to a year, depending on what information we have about your NF. Um, but uh, you can always contact the team if you think that there's something going on that uh, that is is problematic. But it's yeah, it's often up to a year. But we'll we'll see you. We try and see people in the clinic time, so we've we've got all the NF patients together. But we can certainly see people out of sequence if there's a big problem, or even a moderate problem. Okay, awesome. Um, can we get this help in South Australia? With NDIS or Australia wide, it's taken years not only to get a diagnosis, but have recently been able to get some NDIS funding after years of applying. With so much help from Natalie and the CTF, her help was outstanding, helped me so much. The local NDIS lady was amazing, but the Canberra head who did my review didn't even acknowledge it was a neurological disorder. Please help. I'm actually, there's actually a question there. <laughs> but I guess, you know, NDIS is, is something that we can also help with at CTF. Um, but in terms of the clinical space and I guess Australia wide. Well, you know, and I think it's about identifying a key person who wants to take it on in each state and that's actually, it's difficult. Mm. Uh, I'm an adult in my 50s with NF1. Apart from many lumps, bumps everywhere in my body, I don't seem to have any major complications. Is it necessary for me to have a checkup scan to see for any hidden issues? Well, uh, it, that would be a question. For my question would be, um, have they ever had a scan? Um, and pro the, the, the likely answer is probably not, but I can't really give advice without having met the patient and getting all of their background information and everything else. But many patients who really only have cutaneous issues and who we've done, a, or, or, or other um, less severe issues who we've done you know, a set, an assessment on, um, might not even need to come and see us or could just have a, a two yearly telehealth, hello, has anything come up? Or even a, uh, you know, a, a discharge to their GP with a good letter that says what they need to worry about. Um, but for individual people, it's hard to, hard to say, but you know, if you've had a good assessment, um, you certainly don't need yearly scans. And I think that's a little bit of a hangover from a lot of um, clinics where it's just some random registrar who's trying to do the right thing, um, just saying, oh, well, we'll do another scan and see you in a year, all right? Because they don't know how to discharge the patient and they don't want to miss anything. Absolutely. Um, and if one is a degener degenerative disease, what steps can be taken to slow down progression? 
Oh, I think that's I think that's for the clinical trial people. Um, but I mean, the, the hope is that some of the um, targeted agents, the inhibitor drugs that we have, will will slow progression. But um, I think that that the benefit is promising, but modest at this point. Um, and this is this is sort of more of a derm, uh, question. But the markings on the neck, freckling, can they get lasered off? I'm not sure whether you can respond to that. But we can certainly come back on some of these questions if we aren't able to answer them right now as well. Yeah, in the room. So, okay. Uh, my question is, what information is sent to the GPs? Because my GP doesn't seem to. He, he doesn't. He doesn't care. He doesn't know what to do. Um, so, there's two things that I'd say for GPs. Is firstly, if your GP doesn't seem to know what to do, then direct them to the Health Pathways website. But um, we send a letter every time we see a patient to the GP about what the issues were and what the follow-up plan is. Is that your question? Yeah. Um, I think, um, but one thing that's um, a little bit difficult with that is it's re sometimes it's really hard to keep track of people's GPs. So if your GP's not getting anything, make sure that the hospital knows who your GP is because, for instance, you might have a great GP but an issue came up and you got referred by Medical One at Sydenham because that's where you could see a doctor on that weekend. Um, and our hospital will then go, oh, well, we'll send the letter off to Medical One at Sydenham um, because that's the letter that we've got um, and we don't know who you want the letters to go to or whatever. So I think that's a good tip and you may well have done this but to be quite specific about where you want letters to go and who you want to have them. Um, and you can ask for a copy for yourself if you want. Uh, and most letters on uh, hospitals that have an electronic medical record are available on your, on your profile. So that's another way of finding what letters that there are about you. Are there any others in the room with questions? We've just got one more, I'm not sure again. 48% um, of us will develop osteopenia. Should we have bone density scan to get a baseline, especially if we had scoliosis in childhood, which seems to increase our probability? Um, no, I think um, that would be some. So that would be something that I would leave with your GP, um, and I think that would, yeah, in your fifties, you probably should be assessed. But I wouldn't do that in the clinic. Yeah. But I would. I, it's like I send to the GP. Please check blood pressure every six months. Please arrange the mammogram for this time. Please do a DEXA scan at whatever time. So that's the sort of thing that I would put. If we had the if we had the app, that would come out in a much more sort of organised way. Yeah, amazing. Um, there's just one more around clinics in Brisbane. We don't have anything there. Um, I guess the question is that those conversations are always sort of ongoing. Um, but as soon as we have any new information, we'll absolutely let uh, the community know about it. Yep, Hilary. Kate, why are you only talking about mammograms? Why aren't you talking about the other rare cancers that NF can talk about, like GIS and pheochromocytomas? Oh, it, because that just happens to be one of those things that has to have the follow-up in the in the plan. But the pheochromocytoma, I mean, that's really about blood pressure, um, you know, screening um, in, in the first instance. Um, so, I mean, I'm not excluding any other of those cancers. It's just what happens to be what I'm talking about. It's like I didn't really talk about sphenoid wing dysplasia or a bunch of other things. It's just an example, basically. Okay. No yeah. problem because of the guess. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. No problem. So, so, so. Um, I have NF2 and live in Mount Gambier, close to Vic Bordia, but doctors say we can't cross the borders into the... Or does it just can't well, cross the borders? I've, I've got NF2 patients from Mount Gambier. OK, we'll, we'll put you in touch. <laughs> is, is, um, is, is that them? <laughs> no, no, no. I, can, I can give you the name. We can, we can um, put you in touch. So, look, no, but it's a real issue. You can cross state borders, but having said that, if you choose to do that, it is an increased degree of difficulty. Um, so, um, so I look after another rare disease, you know, low-grade glioma, and I look after, I do a particular type of surgery that is not done frequently in Australia, so I have a lot of interstate patients. But my preference is to only do that if they have a neurosurgeon looking after them also in their home state. So I think if you're going to... 
across state borders, which is fine, we also need to find some sort of partnership with a GP or someone who is going to do the day to day because you know we can't solve every seizure or every worry about uh, a skin lump or whatever and also it's not it's it's no fun for you guys to be coming down the highway you know eight hours um every time something goes wrong so you need we need to find some sort of a partnership it's really important okay i think that was the last of the questions from online if there's no other ones in the room um we'll take a break and sorry, oh just, sorry there's one more over here okay hey. Um, just what you were talking about before about the digital care plan, is that going to be up and running soon or...? Need the money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, the reality is to build that properly, so to build that so that um, it's private, like you don't want your information going anywhere, to build it so that it really works, to build it so that it's scalable, um, it's, it's about a quarter of a million dollars which we've got partial funding, we'll get it, don't worry. But it's, it's, a, it's actually, who would think that an app would cost that much? If we were building an app where you uploaded stuff about like um, your car, uh, not a problem uh, because that information doesn't need to be private. It doesn't, it, th there's no, no real consequences to it. But this, this has consequences, it needs to be private, it needs to be properly built, it needs to be all of that. So it's actually a little more expensive than what you would think. Sorry, I've just got one more question that came through online. Great question about cancer from the audience. It says, in Belgium, kids with NF1 get a whole body MRI when they turn 18 and move to adult care. Given the high risk of cancer in young adulthood, should a similar protocol be implemented in Australia? I'm going to leave that one with Gabby. <laughs> oh. Yeah, because you, you talked about this yesterday. Yes, so we did do this um, because uh, five years ago, the literature came out that 50 to 60% of patients with NF1 have a plexiform neurofibroma, about half of them internally. And we found that with our first 20 patients, we just caused anxiety in 11 of them that didn't change management. So we've decided, pending a formal guideline or formal instructions from a different healthcare group, that we would stop doing it and, ma and make our decisions clinically because it wasn't changing what we were doing. So we treat everyone like they have a potential plexiform neurofibroma with the potential for malignant transformation and give everyone the same advice. Oh, we've got one more. Yep. So we, we would assess people often with imaging at their first appointment. Um, but then the problem is knowing about it, um, you can't, you, we can't do a whole body MRI on every adult every year. So number one, it, it's just not possible or available. But number two, there's no evidence that it will make any difference. Um, so how often to screen is actually a very vexed question. Um, and it's, 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 it's difficult. I have a question. If you have a neurofibroma on your breast, what should you watch out for? On your breast? Yeah. It's no different from having it anywhere else on the skin, but you should watch out for it to become um, hard, sore or painful. But if it's just one of the little ones, the likelihood that anything will go wrong with that, other than it being really annoying, um, is, uh, is, is almost nothing. Awesome. Thank you. But I do, if, if, you know, I know those ones are really annoying, you know, bras, et cetera, et cetera. So often I do send people to the breast surgeons to have them removed if they get in the way. Okay, great. Um, for those at home, we're going to take a quick break uh, and we'll come back at 11.30 um, and we'll have a chat around NDIS. Um, but for those in the room, we'll, um, we'll bring you back in 11.30. Thank you.